So my name is David Parry. Um, as Anne said, I'm a senior lecturer at Liverpool uh, Newcastle University. Um, a bit of my story, I started off doing a PhD in Newcastle, then went to Liverpool, did um, 10 years approximately um, postdocing before I got the teaching bug and to get trained up in learning and teaching, I moved to Liverpool Hope to do a learning and teaching fellow. And then I became a lecturer, senior lecturer there, got a position in Newcastle and came up to, um, to take that position. And now I'm a senior lecturer here. I divide my time with point six in on a teaching and scholarship contract and um, point four as director for EDI for the faculty. So, um, and I'm not claiming to be an expert in feedback um, other than the, the path I've been on and the external examining positions. I've been on six external examining positions and studying the literature and getting an understanding of what feedback is. I've also done a study which I'm kind of basing this on today. So the topic I was kind of given is supporting student learning through effective feedback. And I'm hanging that on a study I did in first year perceptions of reflections on feedback because we need to know what students expect from feedback in order to know what they're after, what they're chasing, what, what their optimal um, feedback really is. So why do we care about feedback? Well, as um, Knight said in 2002, feedback is the Achilles heel in terms of quality in higher education. Whenever we ask students what they like about feedback or what they, what, what they like about the course and what they don't like, what they come back to is feedback. And um, they don't like feedback at all. They never express satisfaction. And here's a kind of a snapshot. Obviously the NSS is one of our key points of contact with the students in terms of the end of the studies and what their satisfaction levels are. In terms of the devolved nations, um, England, 74 down to 69, Scotland, 68 down to 66, Wales, well, not so, doesn't look so bad on the surface, 72 to 71, but via 74 and Northern Ireland 75 to 70. We've got to bear in mind that these years here are obviously COVID years and therefore have got a different representation and different student experience. But they've come down, but also compared to the other question sets in SS, they're always lower. Here we've got teaching my course at 87 compared to the, the lower other values. So what is it? Why aren't we giving satisfaction? Well, it doesn't matter what the institution type is or the genesis of the, of the institution, whether it's the Golden Triangle, um, post-92 university colleges, if it's Russell Group or Red Brick, they're all coming back as not giving satisfaction. It's also irrespective of geography. As we saw in the previous slide, the nations all come back low, but also if you look break down the individual nations into regions, they're still low. I mean, London lower here, Northwest and South, it's, and southeast slightly higher, but it's still much lower than teaching on my course and overall satisfaction. So why would assessment and feedback be different to teaching on my course? It's the same people, it's the same organization, it's the same running of the course, and yet it's lower. So why is that the case? Some brackets, for example, organization and management and student union always do come out low too, but we're not gonna worry ourselves with those. We're gonna concentrate on assessment and feedback. It's also irrespective of countries as well across the globe. Lots of countries do student surveys and they all come back saying assessment feedback does not give satisfaction. It also appears to be irrespective of what, um, what tutors do. If you do a Google Scholar search for feedback and higher education, there's a myriad of articles, all based on initiatives that tutors have put in place over the last 20 years to try and improve um, experience of feedback and to improve engagement with feedback and yet the results remain low and get lower. So even though we've got this huge investment of time and energy and resources and finance, students are still not satisfied. So why aren't they? Why are students never satisfied with the feedback they get? Well, let's look at who the experts are. Who, who knows what feedback is and what it should be? I kind of just went through my head and found these as kind of being key points that I thought would probably be important people, important people to talk to. And these people always come through in the literature as being spoken to and being asked what good feedback is. We have students, they study with us for three to four years. They get feedback, they engage with feedback, they receive feedback, they deal with feedback and they want to improve. They want to get better so one would imagine they apply that feedback. 
We've also got postgraduate studies who are asked and they reflect on undergraduate studies. And the third undergraduate students have their um, foundations in secondary education, which gives them an idea of feedback, but maybe that's part of the issue. We have tutors who, who work in the in sector for one, five, 10, 20, however many years. They deliver the feedback, they talk to students, they try to give the students what they need, they try to develop the understanding of what feedback should be. So they're the experts. We have management, we have executive boards within institutions who come back with their NSS every year and they create initiatives, they create policies, they create drives, um, they create action plans to try and improve feedback. HEA comes in, they offer fellowships which require the staff to um, have engaged in feedback. They run courses, they run conferences on feedback. We've offered the students who obviously derive from the NSS and come back to us and give us ideas and give us support, hopefully, but they certainly um, drive students to engage with feedback. We have learning support organizations within universities who are there to encourage and to support the staff and the students in inquiring feedback and building on it. And then we have the government. Um, we, have, um, we have ministers who in theory aren't experts in whatever the ministers are, so maybe they shouldn't be on the list. There's no um, particular reason for this order, potentially, but um, these are all the people who are in the literature being asked about feedback and are hopefully driving forward the process of improving feedback. So first question, what is the perceived wisdom of feedback? And this is when we go to the literature. And as I said, there's a huge amount of literature. I have my favorite sources and my favorite resources here. So I'm gonna go through a few of those and deliver those. But um, before we do that, what I'm gonna do is ask a question. And that's what is your agreed definition of feedback? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna send you to breakout rooms and ask you to agree on a definition of feedback. I'm going to give you five minutes. The first three minutes, I want you to discuss amongst yourselves what feedback should be. Um, I'm going to put five to six per room. I'm going to create those rooms now, but don't go to them just yet. Um, I want you to go onto the slide, at least one member of the group. So if you record down the slider address, slider.com, note down the, the number that you need to enter to enter it. And when You've done three minutes chat. Then I'll shout into the breakout rooms until you've got two minutes left. I want you to spend about a minute coming to your agreed definition. And then I want you to put your agreed definition onto Slido. So we have that resource of what you, you as university members actually think definition of feedback is. We've got various definitions coming in. They're still coming in. You can continue putting them in on Slido. Um, the next step I was going to do was go back to the breakout rooms, but I don't think we're going to have time to do that now because of um, I've got to put the timer on. But was to think about what the student definition of feedback was, because these are the two key players in understanding what feedback is, the tutors and the students. And what we're going to cover as we go through is the dichotomy between those and potentially that, um, that, that they kind of rub up against each other and we, we don't necessarily agree. So in 2013, Evans came up with um, an interesting paper, and the ref reference is available, that there's no general definition for assessment, and few studies have systematically investigated the meaning of assessment of feedback. Now, since then, the 2010 seemed to be a bit of a kickoff for um, investigation into assessment of feedback, and since then, there's been a lot of systematically investigated meaning, but no conclusions have been reached. There's no set definition because we're always asking different people with different opinions. And uh, more recently, Fulham, Kruger and Cohen in 2022 came up with this. Um, I'm just gonna minimize people so I can actually read this. Um, feedback is information provided to recipients about their behavior, performance or understanding. The goal of which is to foster recipients' self-awareness and behavioral reinforcement or change. And that's a huge move. That was a huge move in the literature. Primarily because we've lost this word, the word assessment. And we've moved into behavior, performance, and or understanding, which potentially two of those, understanding and performance, do link in with the concept of assessment. You can measure performance through assessment. You can give grades based on performance and improve performance. And you can actually assess their understanding to an extent. But behavior, how can we measure behavior or determine feedback 
in a written form in terms of assessments from behavior. They go on to talk about self-awareness, and I love this, the idea that feedback could um, be embracing self-awareness. For me, we take on students from um, secondary education, which is a very knowledge-based um, arena, particularly A-levels. It's about regurgitating knowledge and demonstrating knowledge. Whereas we take them in the first year and we hopefully build them up as they go through to a, to a keystone project at the end, where they demonstrate understanding, they demonstrate critical awareness, critical analysis, um, and a general, what I would term, become a scientist for me, for biomedical scientists. Might be for you becoming a historian, becoming a, um, a lawyer, becoming whatever area you're working in, but creating that professional. And feedback needs to drive that process forward. And it needs self-awareness, it needs behavioral reinforcement, and it needs change. So how do we do that? Well, we need to decide who gives good feedback, who, who decides what good feedback is. Now, Dawson et al. in 2018 wrote another really useful paper, What Makes Effective Feedback? And it's from a staff and students perspective. So it brings those two key players into, into the arena together, students from the same courses as the tutors to find out what the agreement is and there wasn't one. They found out that the starkly different views held by students and educators on salient characteristics um, hang on, of quality feedback. So if we don't agree on it, if we don't agree what's good feedback, then how do we meet that agreement? And potentially, they argue, that actually comes drived by terminology. That as tutors, tutors think outside the box and they think about that overall process of feedback across the course, whereas students are potentially driven by that association between assessment and feedback, and that you can't separate the two. And all good students, hopefully, answer the question, the question that they're given. And if the question is to answer about assessment and feedback, then the good students are going to answer that question. So they're only going to talk about feedback in the context of assessment, not any other feedback they've received along the way. So they, um, Dawson et al. say a problem, a further problem with tools such as student satisfaction surveys is that they not only provide metrics, and that's really valuable. We can't get away from useful aspects of, of surveys, asking students what's good about their courses, what's not so good, and those qualitative comments that they come out with along the way, useful information. But the language used with survey items conveys explicitly or implicitly what is valued in education and position students and teachers in particular ways. And from first year through, we do module evaluations, we do institution evaluations, and because we want those to reflect the NSS, we use data sets. So from stage one, potentially, we're giving them that association between assessment and feedback in what we're asking them. And therefore, we're driving the dialogue into feedback from an assessment viewpoint. Which moves us on to who's responsible for feedback? Where, where, where's the drive for feedback and who needs to engage with it and where, where it needs to come from? Winston and Bowd, together with um, their colleagues here, and Winston and Bowd are, are, are big publishers in the feedback area. Um, they publish Measuring What Matters, the positioning of students and feedback processes in the national student surveys. Now, what's important here is that this is a big study. This is a study where they actually went global and started looking at national student surveys across the world. And they kind of found about 30, 32, I think. They reached out to those surveys and they got those surveys and they looked at the responses to the surveys and they studied it. And they reached out to people involved in those surveys and got response from, I think it was 10 in the end. So those are the ones they concentrated on. They pulled those surveys apart and looked for questions which um, they believed reflected some sort of feedback aspect. And they studied those questions. And what they found was that the questions, although the literature is moving away from um, tutors being the primary agents of feedback, the questions very much drove, I think Australia was the one exception to this, very much drove that students were the passive recipients. The questions were all driven in the way that um, the, the tutors gave the feedback and the students received the feedback, but there was no follow on from that. So as they said, rather than transmission of information from teacher to students, greater net recognition of the fundamental role of the learner in seeking, generating and using feedback information is evident in the international literature. 
So although the literature's moved on from there, to an extent, we're still stuck in the place where feedback is assessment driven. And we're kind of, we've got to pull those apart in order to actually get students to engage in that behavioral change and that self-awareness. Now that kind of looks like we're putting the onus on the students, but we're not because the students need good feedback in order to apply it. In order to generate and use good feedback, they need to have that good feedback in the first place. So why is feedback important? Well, literature says there's two key aspects, support learning and promote achievement. Now on the surface, those look like the same thing, but actually they're philosophically different. Supporting learning is about that journey I mentioned before, the journey from being a student to being a professional, from being a student to being um, a scientist in, in my field. So it's giving them the abilities to move through that process, to become reflective practitioners, to, um, to being critically aware, critically evaluating individuals who can think outside the box and not just regurgitate information, but actually process information and construct something that is a key um, keystone project at the end. Whereas promoting achievement is more what potentially the students are looking at in terms of making sure they've got that grade at the end because they want that job. They're not too concerned about those key skills they pick up along the way. So long as they potentially, so long as they get that first, that two one at the end, then they're happy. So I would argue that supporting learning is what tutors are aiming at, promoting achievement is what students are aiming at, generically. And we can't just put students all in one box because they're all individuals with their own needs and desires. So broad meanings from this, um, Nelson and Shun brought out these three concepts. Informational, where feedback consists of information that the learner needs to change their performance in a particular direction. So informational is giving them the information they need to proceed. Reinforcement, specific rewards or punishment for particular behaviors. So example, this might be something like error spelling, spelling error, sorry, or um, some sort of approach to writing. So reinforcement of their, their critical skills, their key skills to make sure that they can achieve better. But they're motivational. Feedback has to be motivational. It's got to push students forward, want them to, get better, to, to aim higher, to reach the, the better stage of the, the process in terms of supporting their learning. So quickly, what's, what's concentrated on the literature, just as a kind of a literature analysis? Literature concentrates on the purpose of feedback. That's what we've just covered. Why do we do it? What's it for? What's it aimed to do? I'm gonna to come to that more. What's its source? Most of it's staff feedback, but there is a little bit underlying of peer feedback although the literature will suggest that students don't really value that and they see it as a bit of a cop-out. And what's the medium? How do you deliver it? Those are the three main areas of research, which are kind of superficial in the way, but it kind of shows the level to which tutors and universities are trying to engage with feedback and try to make it better. So key question, what do students say determines if feedback's any good? And now we're going back to that idea of assessment of feedback being intrinsically linked. So Stunworth and Sanchez in 2013 did a study of postgraduates, which has the added benefit that they've been through their undergraduate degree, they've got more experience of feedback, but it does very much concentrate on the written feedback. And they got feedback, they, they, they talked to students and staff to find out what's good and what's bad. And there's very few surprises in this list. What's good, what's important is clarity of language in terms of not only handwriting, et cetera, but also terminology. For example, Brown and in 2007 and um, the previous study uses these concepts. We've got to make sure the students understand what we're saying. If we say be more evaluative, to us that makes sense. But to your average student, what do they understand by that? What does that actually mean to them? We need to break that down for them. Similarly, you're not reflecting properly. That's not useful. That's not motivational. That's not going to support the students. That's telling them not what they're doing wrong, but doesn't push them forward and tell them what they're doing right. Focus on sentence structure. If a student's not got good sentence structure, then tell them to focus on it, it's not gonna help. Whereas actually pointing in that direction does. And finally, and uh, according to um, Brown's study, this, uh, this comment particularly annoyed a student to the point of wanting to walk away from the course. Good use of basic sources. Good says it's good. Basic suggests it's not. What does that mean? Is it kind of saying good use of basic sources, so it's pretty poor? Or is it saying good use of basic sources, 
they don't get our terminology. They're not hearing our voice when we, they read it. So we need to think about that. Then we've got timeliness of response. Now, for many of us, this means that time we have to market. But to students, that's not necessarily the case. Something that's interesting from the literature, um, Dawson et al., a previous author that we talked about, said that if you ask a student about that time period between submission and receiving the feedback, they say it's not long enough. And that's pretty much regardless of how long it is. It's too long, sorry. That is, there's too much time between submission and receiving feedback. But on the other hand, if you ask students what's good and what's bad about feedback, very rarely does the time between submission and receiving feedback get raised. So it's only when we give them that question, does it become an issue according to literature? Sometimes it does, but largely the students won't mention that time period if they're not directed towards looking at it. And then assess survey does, and therefore we do in our module evaluations, et cetera. Sufficiency of detail, again, a no brainer. We need to give them enough information. Consistency between feedback providers, we all get that. If you've got a big course, you've got 10 markers on it, then got two options. One is dumb it down. So you've got three points, three good points, three bad points. Every marker does those, but that constrains the markers in terms of what they can give. So the students actually lose out with that, but then trying to encourage all markers to give more isn't necessarily that easy. Relevance of comments. Now that's not relevant to the assessment that they've just done. That's relevant to future assessments. That's relevant to the essay they're gonna do next week. So making sure that that feedback actually becomes feed forward and they can take the comments you've given them on this assignment in future assignments and therefore improve performance. And individuation, which I didn't know was a word of response. This is making sure the students feel worth that you've put worth, worthiness to their report, even if it's not good. They've probably put a lot of time into it all the same, and they need to feel that we see worth in what they've done. And if we just put a few comments on and don't give them worth in it, then they're not gonna be motivated and they're not gonna come back and do better. So that was that study, which is very much based on written feedback. But then we come to 2020, where things have moved on a bit. And we're Winston and Barrett, um, some people have seen before, who wrote a paper called The Need to Distangle, Dis Distangle Assessment from Feedback in Higher Education. So now they're concentrating on the fact that we need to move away from feedback being assessment driven. And they suggested the six main problems that are caused by this entanglement. First of all, students only focus on grades and therefore if they get the grade and it's purely assessment linked. Once they've got the grade, they move on and don't actually engage with their feedback. They argue that comments justifying grades rather than learning support. And one of the quotes that came in this paper is kind of a backside covering exercise to avoid student complaint. So if feedback purely is written to support the, what the, mark is mark, the marker has given as a mark, as a grade, then it's not gonna have feed forward. So it's not gonna be useful. So then again, that's caused by assessment-driven feedback. Feedback too late to be useful. Now, again, this isn't about the timeliness. This is about where it's placed in the course. So this is about making sure that a student submits their work, they get the feedback, but a week before they got the feedback, they submitted an essay again. So the same sort of assessment on a different topic. They get the feedback and they then realize that what they submitted a week earlier is actually making the same mistakes. So making sure we've got that nice Gantt chart of assessment and feedback to make sure that students can see the process before they start. And they know they're gonna get feedback from A before they submit B, so they can apply feedback from A to B. And we need to emphasize that they need to do that and to make sure they kind of follow that process through. The, another problem, feedback subordinated to all processes in course design. So when we do a module design, when we're taking on a new course or a new module, we fill in the module proposal, we have our learning outcomes, we have our aims, we have our assessments, we have our teaching sessions. Where's the space for feedback? I don't know, I don't think I've worked, I've not seen that works in the university or been an external examiner for the university that actually has feedback within that process. So feedback's often an afterthought. 
And it's often constrained by the assessment because the assessment is leads to the feedback. But if feedback is actually written into the module design, then potentially we and the students will see it more intrinsically and therefore we can separate it from the assessments. So not just say, we'll be giving a set feedback on this assessment and that assessment, but actually make it more integrated in the learning and teaching sessions and potentially even the learning outcomes, assuming they stick around this discussion about them not doing so. Emphasis on over-documentation of feedback. If feedback is purely on assessment, then you're marking 50 scripts. The first five get really enthusiastic, driven response because you're, you're, you're fresh to it and you're thinking, yes, that's really good. No, you want to change that. And you get to 10, you're a little bit weary. Get to 20, you're really tired. Get to 25 and you're just going through the hoops. And you're largely giving generic feedback you've given to previous assessments. You kind of go and turn it in and you're selecting your previous comments and pushing them through. And therefore, if that's the sole feedback they're getting or the perceived they're getting, then it's going to be dreary. And finally, downgrading feedback creates um, by requirements of anonymous marking. Now, anonymous marking is something I have studied in the past. And in the study I did, when we first talked about anonymous markings, the students thought it was absolutely fantastic. They loved the idea of anonymous feedback because it removed bias, it removed prejudice. But when they thought about it and thought about the continuity of study and how a market could actually reflect on previous work and give them guidance based on how they've improved and be more motivational in that way, then they were less um, concerned with it. So there's pros and cons of anonymous marking, but one of the issues is, is if feedback's purely down to assessment and the assessment is anonymous, then we've got less ideal process. So they argued that the intimate relationship between assessment and feedback, which is driven by policy and practice, blurs the purpose of feedback. So it makes feedback purely monodimensional and purely within the concepts of assessment. And I can't move on my screen for some reason. There you go. Which brings us back to the quote we had at the beginning from Fulham, um, Kruger and Cohen. Feedback is information provided by recipients about their behavior, performance and understanding. So away from assessment, assessment's not even there. We don't talk about assessment of feedback or assessment feedback. We talk about behavior performance, uh, self-awareness and behavioral change. Which leads me on to this, which is actually a model from Dunworth and Sanchez, which was that list of um, good and bad points in feedback that we saw before. But actually this could be applied much broader than just in terms of written feedback. Effective and interpersonal, and it's a kind of really nice intersectional melding together of different aspects, but going beyond what we see as standard. It's got to be effective and interpersonal. So promote confidence, increase motivation, build relationships. If we give solid motivational feedback, then the students will leave it feeling better and it will build relationships. One of the students in this study said that they receive negative feedback when it comes to the next one, next piece of assessment, they're less driven and also they're more careful. They're less willing to take risks in assessment because they've been so demotivated by the previous feedback, they're not willing to take that extra step and try and be imaginative in their assessments. But also if we're positive and motivation in our feedback, then the students are more likely to come on board with us and talk to us about it and go forward. They're more likely to discuss it. Orientational, now this comes into the classic kind of feedback for written assignments box. It's about clarifying understanding, it puts, so tells the students where they are in the process. If they get 50%, they know they've got to do better. If they've got 70%, they can think about how they can improve on that 70%. So it gives them an idea of where they're moving and the course that they're on. If they've gone from 50 to 60 to 70, they know on the right course. If they're stuck at 50, then potentially they need to do something different. And also clarifies what we are expecting the students to do. But the last bracket is something that um, was novel to me when I first thought about it. That feedback needs to promote reflection to get the students to think about what they're doing by giving them feedback, which makes them reflect. We can actually move them forward. It enhances understanding. It builds up their understanding of the topic. It's not just about giving them a grade. It's about building their understanding, improved performance, but also increases autonomy. If we give them feedback, which enables them to reach beyond where they are, then autonomy will follow from that. And um, Autonomy is something that is driven for in the literature, literature, and it turns out that we're not very good at delivering it as a sector. 
So ideally, where should feedback come from? Well, it's got to be a dialogue rather than a monologue. The feedback we give them has got to get students to not be passive recipients, but active engagers. So it may lead to an actual conversation, but it just might lead to the students having a dialogue within themselves about how our feedback can improve their work. And ideally, it will lead to a conversation, potentially in the lab, in a seminar, beyond there, where they can actually develop that conversation. So it's not just that one-off stop shop of receiving the feedback and moving forward. It's about the whole journey of their the years in higher education. So feedback isn't about receiving that piece of information. It's about the whole process of education. And we need to find a way, and I perceive that tutors mostly believe this, we need to find a way of getting students to believe this. It also needs to extend, as I said, from the summative to formative and then beyond. So not just about that summative assessment aspect or the formative ass um, assessment. It needs to be about that whole conversation. So um, very briefly at the end, what we did um, in terms of the study that I was carrying out, I did it in 2019. I started off by surveying the first year students about what they thought feedback is or should be to find out what they're expecting and what they're anticipating. The idea was to build this into concentrating in one region of the UK, the northeast of England, um, building and to look at a range of higher education institutes. So hope, I was talking to Northumbria, to Teesside, to Sunderland and to, to Durham about how we could reach and do the same survey with them to get more of, a, of an idea. We stopped just in the first year, but still planning to build on it. Our methodology was we had 15 minute interviews, um, 15, 15 minute interviews with students to get a kind of a, um, a thematic review of what we should be looking at. Did a pilot questionnaire and then did a final semi structured questionnaire. We distributed Fire Survey Monkey to first years um, with anonymity assured. The question had three main sections demographics, find out who they are and where they came from. We looked at happiness in order to give a baseline of how content the students are, so we could knew where they were starting from. And then the bulk of it was feedback from previous um, education and also from the present education. In terms of demographics, we had 110 respondents from 360 students, which was quite gratifying. 71% um, um, identified as female which kind of represented what we anticipated from a student body. Our student body is 70 to 75% female. And um, we asked them about the family and university experience. What happened in the past? We noted that um, we did this because um, we wanted to know what the students were told about it before they came. If parents told the students what kind of, um, what, what they were walking into, then potentially it would change their perceptions. So 33% said no close family members had experience of university, which, which surprised me. 50% said their parents had attended university, one or both. And 23% said they had a sibling who had or was in the university sector at that time. So in terms of contentment, this was quite pleasing, but also made me question how, they, how much they believed it was anonymous. Because 95% said they found the whole university experience enjoyable, with 98% saying it met their social expectations and 100% um, saying it met them academically. I'm not convinced that was necessarily the case, um, but that's what they told us. 94% said they felt supported pastorally and 92% said they felt supported academically, which gave us a baseline saying these students were relatively content and therefore they weren't out to grumble and complain. And it gave me more confidence in what they said after that. Then came the feedback questions. What was their perception of feedback? Started off by asking to define feedback. We asked them the criteria, the use and value in terms of the assessment criteria. We asked them what they experienced in feedback before university and what they were experiencing now. So we got that comparison between what they got um, in college or school beforehand and what they're getting at university. In terms of definition, was pretty standard. Most of the uh, definitions came back saying that it was about marking, it was about improvement, it was about looking to the future, it was about getting told what was wrong, and it was about criticism of their work. So pretty standard definitions, all linked to assessment. And we haven't mentioned assessment now. We asked them about feedback generally to define feedback. 
but it was all pretty much about assessment. Some of them talked about behavior, which was nice, finding weaknesses and suggestions of a way to improve, which was good, but it was all about assessment and, and a lot of it was about grades. So it was a very monodimensional um, process in the students' eyes. Some of them talked implicitly about feed forward, about using that feedback in the future, but it was very much about receiving information and then potentially doing something with it. But there was not much about doing. It was mostly about getting the mark. That was pretty much what they saw feedback was about. In terms of prior experience, um, prior to university, about 80% said they received written and verbal feedback at school. So that's probably something that they're going to find different now, I'd anticipate. Still got lots of written feedback, especially since the definitions were about feedback and assessment. About half and half said that their, um, the perception had changed, their understanding had changed, and 74% said that it was very different um, from previous experience at university. I'm not going to break these down now, but I believe that uh, it's going to be available. But basically, what they say is that at school, a teacher came around, they talked them through the feedback, told them how they could get better. Some of them would have an hour's meeting a week to talk about um, feedback and talk about their progress, which is not something they're going to get at university. So that's kind of the key differences is that conversation they saw as being lacking. In terms of other forms of feedback beyond assessment, we got 16 comments which were actually linked. And some talked about demonstrators in labs, some talked about seminars, some talked about external organizations beyond the school within the university who could give them feedback. But um, the majority just didn't see feedback beyond assessment. In terms of is feedback only summative work? Pretty much yes. Um, if it was only, um, if it wasn't summative, then the chances are it was kind of linked to formative feedback. It wasn't, a few came back with ideas about practicals and seminars being feedback, but not many. So in summary, the students are pretty content in the university experience. So they're happy at this point. Feedback isn't the same as they've known before. They seem to understand why it's not the same. They seem to understand that universities should be different and they should be more autonomous, but that doesn't make them happy with the idea. The majority of students seem to see feedback in terms of summative assessment only, although some do see a broader context. Intuitively, some yearn for a dialogue that they had before. So what's important is the pretty content with the university experience. So that first question set on the NSS is still coming back positive. When it comes to assessment and feedback, however, they're not happy because it's not what they want. It's not what they're taught to believe that secondary education is what it's all about. So finishing off, um, coming to conclusion, Tutors see feedback as a whole glomulus process, the whole process from beginning to end of the university degree, all those conversations they have, all those dialogues they have, it links in with assessment, but not solely assessment. Whereas students see it as that um, attainment level. Attaining is driven by feedback, which is driven by feedback on assessment. And this quote here is from the survey we did, uh, the, the investigation we did. The major difference in second, in, um, higher education is we aren't guided or told exactly what we did wrong. We have to figure it out ourselves. I was expecting this to be the case prior to starting university, but that's not what they want. And that's not what drives them. Okay, and that's me. <laughs>